A lot of stuff to get through today. I've been trying to cut as much as I can, but uh, the more I try to cut, the more it seems to expand, so we'll see how this goes. But what's really interesting about uh, this passage is, uh, you know, it seemed like Abraham was at a place where God literally answered all his prayers. You know, God made him rich. God made him famous. God finally gave him the child that he's been longing for. Uh, literally just Abraham was in such a good place, um, enjoying the, the, the presence and the blessings of God. And suddenly, out of nowhere, Abraham would probably tell you he kind of feels blindsided. God comes to test Abraham. And he says in verse 1, he says, Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And, you know, uh, his probable response was like, Yeah, God, like, like I'm here. You know, um, good Lord, who's blessed me so much. And God just blows Abraham away. And he said, Take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. You see, this, this is one of those passages where it's really hard to understand, you know? Um, but one thing we do know is God is coming to test Abraham. This is a testing. You see, God not only blesses, but God tests so that he could bless even more. So why does God test Abraham? You see, that's kind of the first question that naturally comes up to the reader when, when we're going through these passages. Why does God test Abraham? And, you know, personally, individually, why does God test us, his, his people? Now, um, the, the reason of God's testing is kind of hidden within the text, and it takes a lot of time to kind of draw it out using other texts that's found in other parts of the Scripture but one thing that's really highlighted here in this passage is Abraham's response. Um, how did Abraham respond? Which leads to kind of the, the, the understanding of what, it actually, what exactly is faith and what exactly is obedience. Because this is actually Abraham's finest moment. This is actually when Abraham, according to the New, New Testament, became the father of faith. Somebody that we could see as a model and as an example of what it means to live a life of faith and obedience. You see, if you look at the context, Abraham's whole world came crashing down. God made absolutely no sense to Abraham. Why? Because he commanded Abraham to do something that Abraham knew that he forbade in other places. You see, God was against sacrifice. But God comes to Abraham and he says, I want you to sacrifice. It created a lot of dissonance in Abraham's mind. And not only that, it seemed like God was taking away a gift that he earlier gave because for, from the beginning, God was telling Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. And right when God gave Abraham a son, God comes to him and he says, I'm going to take him away. You see, this makes no sense. This is, this is dissonance at its finest, <laughs> Right? Does God really give and take away? Does God really give and take away so that our heart will choose to say, <laughs> blessed be the name of the Lord? Does God really do that? No, he does not. He does not do that. Right? That's not a good song. You know? Um, yeah. So what do we learn about God here? You know, it's so easy to kind of go to God, right? It's like, what's God doing? Like, what's his purpose behind all this? But I think the, the main reason why this text was written was to see the response of Abraham. So before we go into what the heck is God doing, let's go into what the text seems to be leading us, which is how is Abraham responding? What's faith about? What's obedience about? You see, first thing we learn here is Abraham didn't judge God. God tested Abraham. Abraham didn't test God. Right? 
You see, the problem in our society is because of the rise of intellectualism, the rise of rationalism, you know, the, the rise of science, the rise of the fact that now we have the intellectual, scientific, technological capacity to understand as much as we want to understand, we've pushed God to a place where now God has to prove that he is understandable. God has to prove that he does make sense. So if God doesn't make sense to us, if we don't understand, and if we don't agree, then it's not us that's wrong. God must be wrong. You see, that's kind of how most of us understand, uh, you know, life. But did you know that logic is the only thing between you and a miracle sometimes? Right? Logic, logic is the only thing between you and a miracle. Why? Because if we constantly live our lives by logic, if we constantly live our lives by, own, or by our own understanding, it has to make sense to us and we have to agree, we will very rarely experience the supernatural. Right? So why are we like this? Because for some of us, we can really identify with Abraham. We don't want to trust God when God doesn't make sense. We don't want to obey God when God kind of goes outside of the parameters that we created for him to be God in our lives. So why are we like this? You know, uh, why do we respond this way? Well, you know, one of the answers is, is because we only know God partially. Uh, what do I mean by that? You see, you see Scripture talks about God uh, in, in, in so many variety of ways. So, uh, you know, in seminary, one of the things that we learn is God is imminent. It's kind of this word called imminence of God. And the imminence of God basically means that God is knowable. God is someone that we can have a relationship with. God is someone that comes to us and talks to us and relates with us and draws near to us. So, so imminence is basically you can be close to God, you can have a relationship with God, you can know God, uh, you know, you can be intimate with God. So, you know, uh, that's what imminence is. Transcendence, which is kind of the other side, is the fact that God is mysterious. God is not understandable. There are certain things that God does that blows our minds. Uh, transcendence means Isaiah chapter 55, where God says to us, your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Transcendence is where God says to us in Deuteronomy chapter 9, you see, you think you know everything, but I have certain things called secret things that I have not revealed to you, and these are things that you don't know. The secret things belong to God, but the things that revealed belongs to us. So there's transcendence, this mysterious, um, kind of this like far awayness, this, you know, this, uh, you know, this idea that God is, God is hard to figure out. And then there's this other side where God is knowable. We can relate with God. God comes and speaks to us, and we can have a close, loving relationship with God. And in every generation, society has told us the church swings from one place to another place. In every generation, the church either leans toward imminence or the church leans towards transcendence. And, you know, back in the day, the church leaned towards transcendence, but these days, the church is actually leaning toward imminence. So, you know, uh, what's the problem with that, right? So, you know, because we want to be so close to God, we want to know God, you know, uh, we want to understand God, we want to walk with God, we want to experience God, we want to love God, which is... Nothing is wrong with that. That's something that we should all be pursuing after. Here's the problem. When something bad happens, when we go through suffering, when we go through hardships, when life makes no sense, and our whole world is kind of, you know, flipped upside down, if we only know a God of imminence, then a God of our own understanding, a God that we figured out, cannot help us with the problems of life. Why? Because if we can't help ourselves, then how can a God that we figured out help us? 
So you see, because we've lost the transcendence, this mysterious greatness of God, because of that, many of us have a relationship with a God, many of us know a God that we have no faith in when times become very, very hard. Why? Because if God is someone who we figured out, why be so impressed with him? Why? Why worship him? And most ultimately, why trust him? You see, only when we believe in a God that we don't fully understand, only when we believe in a God where we know at times that we're not going to agree, do we have a God who can help us with the problems of our lives when we ourselves cannot figure out how to get ourselves out of that problem. You see, because of our ego, our pride, our rationality, it's made uh, we made a God of our own imagination. And because of that, depression has risen, fear has risen, anxiety has risen, and unhappiness has risen. Now, why is that? Why is that? Because we can't trust God. We can't trust God, especially when life gets flipped upside down, especially when times get very hard. And not only we, can't we not trust God, we can't trust ourselves because there's, there's nothing we can think of that can get us out of the situation that we're in. So if I can't trust God and I can't trust myself, where does that lead you? Fear, anxiety, depression, unhappiness, right? That's where we're at. And why is that? Is it because God is small and God can't help us? Is it because God is powerless and God is weak? No. It's because we have lost the understanding that God is great. Can I get an amen on that? God is great. And what I mean by great is this, greater than our own understanding. Greater than our own knowledge, greater than our own agreement, greater than our own understanding of how life should be, and greater than the, our own pathway that we created on how to live a happy life. God is greater than that. And there's gonna come times in our lives where God is gonna shake everything we know about life and even about him. And if we don't believe in the mysteriousness, the greatness, the sovereignty, and the power of God, then it's gonna really shake us to the foundation because we realize we can't trust God, nor can we trust ourselves. You see, when God came to Abraham, he literally shook Abraham's life. But Abraham trusted in God because he knew God was mysterious. He knew God was great. He knew God was transcendent. And he still knew deep in his heart that God was good. You see, when you live your life, you need to live life with a center point. Scriptures call it a cornerstone. So all of us, we live life with a center point. Whether you know it or not, you do. And it shows by your response. It shows by kind of, you know, uh, how you make decisions. So, you know, uh, the center point is very simple, is will it be you or will it be God? Will it be you or will it be God? You see, Abraham's starting point or his center point was God. God was his cornerstone. And, and as God was his cornerstone, Abraham actually had this boundary of interpretation. And, and what I mean by this boundary of interpretation is the way he understood his situation, the way he understood God, the way he understood himself never left this boundary of interpretation. So he refused to push himself out of this boundary, no matter what happened. So his understanding of God was God is sovereign God is good, he is all-loving, he is all-knowing, he is all-powerful, and no matter what 
God said, no matter what other people said, no matter what the circumstances of his life was, Abraham never left that boundary of interpretation. So basically, when God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son, which is, once again, I told you before, right? Uh, God forbade that. It seemed like God gave it to him and was about to take it away. Abraham never left that boundary of interpretation. So even God's command didn't shift or alter or change who Abraham believed God to be and the promises that Abraham, God made to Abraham. Right? There was a certain discipline. There was a certain discipline that Abraham had, which is actually a mark of godliness on how he looked at life. There was a certain discipline that Abraham had on how he looked at suffering and how he looked at hardship and how he looked at uh, things that made no sense. And he never allowed anything to break that boundary of interpretation that he had on the goodness of God, the love of God, and the all knowledge and the sufficiency of God. So even when God came and literally rocked his world, right, when God came and rocked this world, it was so easy for Abraham to say, you know what, God, forget you. Forget you. I'm not going to follow you anymore. You see, that's a person who does not have a boundary of interpretation. When God came and literally rocked Abraham's world, Abraham didn't say, you know what, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. That person does not have a boundary of interpretation. Right? Instead, what Abraham said was, I refuse to leave this boundary even if the rest of my life makes no sense because the only thing that I'm going to cling to is God himself. So that night, Abraham went into his tent and he didn't sleep. He had a sleepless night. How can you sleep? How can you sleep if you're a father? And all night, his mind was racing probably 1,000 miles per hour. What is God doing? Why did he say this? What's going to happen? How is this going to turn out? What is life about? Who am I? Who is God? Do you see? He had the same thoughts that we all have when we go through suffering and the thoughts that we have when life makes no sense. But because Abraham had this boundary of interpretation that didn't let nothing shift, alter, or change his understanding of God, you know what his conclusion was? His conclusion was, you know what? He said, I think God is going to resurrect my son. That was his understanding. You know, in Hebrew, chapter 11, after a sleepless night, this was his conclusion. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son, and it was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered, which is the word for deeply meditate. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead. That was his conclusion. He said, thinking to himself, he said, okay, God is good. He's all-knowing, he's all-powerful. I'm not going to let anything shake that. But he did say this, this is my life, this is my circumstance. And with this human understanding, he said, you know what? There must be no other way. God's going to bring resurrection. Right. And you see Abraham's faith on display. He leaves the tent early in the morning. And he starts his journey, and you see in verse 5, he says, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there. 
and we will worship, and we will return to you. And then you see another expression of faith. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? You know, uh, if it wasn't so tragic, this sounds so comical, right? And then you see Abraham's faith again. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. You know what Abraham said to Isaac right now? He said, God will provide. I trust that God will provide. God will make things good. Right? So um, what was God's response? You know, the text tells us that Isaac was laid on the altar. And as Abraham was about to strike Isaac, God stops him. And God says, stop. And Abraham sees a ram. And God says, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice the ram instead. Right? So what was God's response to Abraham's faith? What was God's response to Abraham's obedience? It was blessing. It was blessing. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know something if God does take away, it's for the purpose of giving even more. Amen? God wanted to bless Abraham so much. How did God bless Abraham? Right. You know, what's really interesting is God uses our faith to experience him. So faith is a tool that God gives for us to go deeper and deeper into our understanding of who God is. You know, before God intervenes in verse 8, you see Abraham's faith. So in verse 8, Abraham said, God will provide. God will provide. Jehovah Jireh, for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. So this is before. And Abraham, probably one of the most finest statements of faith that he ever made in his life. He looks at his son and he says, God will provide. God will make everything good. I trust God with all my heart. And then after, in verse 14, Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. You see, same word, God will provide, God will provide, but two completely different experiences. One was conceptual, verse 8. Verse 14 was experiential. You see, most of us sitting here today, we understand God will provide. Most of us sitting here today, we have a conceptual understanding that God will provide. Most of us sitting here today, we have, a, we, you know, we have the knowledge that God is a God who provides. But God doesn't want to just leave us in that conceptual knowledge, but God wants us to experience that, to experience the fact that he will provide. So what's the bridge between concept and experience. And what we learn in Genesis chapter 22 is the bridge, is the bridge of faith and obedience. Faith and obedience. Faith and obedience 
is what takes us from the concept of God, the knowledge of God, the understanding of God, to now the experience of God. And if you don't cross that bridge, the concept of God will become distasteful to you. If you don't cross that bridge, the knowledge of God will not be sufficient for you. If you don't cross that bridge by faith and obedience, then church will not be fun for you, exciting for you. Why? Because if you just stay at that area of knowledge and concept and understanding, what's going to happen is because you don't experience God and you experience the things of the world, the things of the world that you experience will become more attractive to you rather than the things of God. And ultimately, your faithfulness, your fidelity, your, your commitment to the Lord will decrease more and more and more and more. This is why the Bible says the things that you have if you do not obey, the things that you have if you do not have faith, even those things will be taken away from you. Right? This is how important faith and obedience is. Why? Because God doesn't just want to leave us at the idea of concept, but God wants us to bring us to that place of experience. But the only bridge to that is by our faith and by our obedience. Right? So uh, here's the second thing. God blessed Abraham in such a powerful way with revelation. Um, because of Abraham's faith and obedience, God said to Abraham on that mountain, on this mountain, Mount Moriah, God said, Abraham, I'm about to show you something that's going to happen 2,000 years later. That on this exact same mountain, I'm going to show you the real Lamb of God that is going to be sacrificed. You know how we know this? This mountain, mountain of Moriah, uh, we see in 2 Chronicles, was actually uh, Jerusalem. It was Jerusalem. So God told Abraham to go to Jerusalem and to sacrifice Isaac on a mountain. And we know 2,000 years later, Jesus, God's only son, was sacrificed on the mountain in Jerusalem. Right? I believe God brought Abraham to the exact same mountain that Jesus was supposed to be sacrificed on to let Abraham know, Abraham, it wasn't just supposed to be Isaac that was supposed to die. It was everyone that was supposed to be die, that was supposed to die. But I not only saved Isaac, but I'm going to save the entire world through the sacrifice of a real lamb, the sacrifice of a real ram that's going to take away the sins of the world. And it's not going to be because of the sacrifice of your son, but it's going to be because of the sacrifice of my son. And because of the sacrifice of my son, the whole world will be saved. And I believe God gave Abraham that prophetic revelation on that mountain because Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 56, he says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. When did Abraham see Jesus' day? When did Abraham see Jesus? He probably saw him at Mount Moriah when Jesus said, no, you don't sacrifice Isaac because Isaac's not going to die for the world. I'm going to sacrifice my son because my son will die for the world. So you know why God did this? You know why God did this? Because when you look at Scripture from Genesis all the way to Revelation, you see these foreshadowings, these, these um, you know, uh, they call it typology. You see these foreshadowings of the gospel all throughout and in Genesis chapter 22, that was one of the foreshadowings. And this is one of the reasons why God, God called Abraham to sacrifice his son. Right? Um, last, so how does God bless Abraham? First, the concept became experience. Second, 
Abraham got to see Jesus in a way that no Old Testament saint was ever able to see him. Third, God powerfully blessed Abraham. Powerfully blessed Abraham. Verse 15, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. So the Lord says, I know what you have done. I see your faith. I see your obedience. And then look at verse 17. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. And I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Abraham, because of his faith and obedience, God powerfully blessed Abraham, God powerfully blessed his family, and God powerfully blessed the nations all around. Isn't that what you want? Do you want that? Do you want God to bless you? Do you want God to bless your family? Do you want God to bless the nations through you? Well, Abraham got that. How did that happen? Through his faith and through his obedience. You see, brothers and sisters, every Christian is deeply loved by God. And there's nothing we can do to break that. Nothing. Nothing we can do to break that. Every Christian is deeply loved by God. And his love is not earned. His love is not worked for. His love is not because of our righteousness. His love is by grace. His love is freely given. And the only way to receive his love is by faith. So his love must be received. So every Christian is deeply loved by God. But not every Christian is fruitful. Not every Christian is effective. Not every Christian is a blessing. But when we seek to be fruitful by our faith and obedience, then we get blessed even more. Not only do we get blessed powerfully, not only do our children get blessed powerfully, but the world around us gets blessed powerfully. So my encouragement to all of you is live that faith, live that obedience, especially when times don't make sense, so that you may receive all the blessings that our Heavenly Father wants to give to you because of His great love for you. Amen? Amen. You know, as we start uh, this new year in 2023, I, I was kind of praying about this sermon and what God wanted to say, and I think this should be our application you know, um, what we learn from this text is children are a blessing. Isaac was a tremendous blessing to Abraham. And, and our children are a blessing to us. Amen? Isn't our children a blessing to us, right? You know. <laughs> I think I saw one of you guys go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're a blessing, yeah. But one of the things we learn in this text is children are a test. Our children are a test. God gives children to us as a test. Now, why does God test us with our children? Why does God do that? I think the reason why is because he doesn't want us to mess them up. And the way we mess them up is with our love. Did you know you could mess up your children with your love? Do you know how many loving parents overprotect their children? You know how many loving parents submit to the children's happiness? Do you know how many loving parents do everything for their children? Right? You know, uh, there's an epidemic where so many parents now submit to the happiness of their children. Now, I understand who doesn't want their kids to be happy. I want my kids to be happy, right? 
But there's a difference between wanting them to be happy and submitting to their happiness. And we see this in our parents who can't bear to see our children cry, who can't bear to see our children angry, who can't bear to see our children disappointed, especially at us. It bothers us, right? So we don't discipline our children. Instead, they discipline us, right? We raise them up to be little dictators. A psychologist once said, two-year-olds, right, are the most violent people on earth, <laughs> right? They kick, they bite, they steal other people's property, and we do nothing, right? You know, um, this one psychologist, he said, children cannot simply let, be left to their own devices, untouched by society, and bloom into perfection. This means that they are much more likely to go complexly astray if they are not trained, disciplined, and properly encouraged. Children must be shaped and informed, or they cannot thrive. It makes perfect sense, right? You know? But he goes on, he says, modern parents are simply paralyzed by the fear that they will no longer, liked, no longer be liked or even loved by their children if they chastise them for any reason. They want their children's friendship above all and are willing to sacrifice respect to get it. This is not good. A child will have many friends, but only two parents. Do you agree with this? Right? You know, uh, Pastor Keith, he said this, if your teenager thinks you're cool, you have serious problems, man. <laughs> right? You have serious problems. Now, if your little kid thinks you're a superhero, that's great. Because you should be a superhero when you're little kids, you have little kids. But when your teenagers think you're cool, you got serious problems. But Pastor Keith also said, when your children are in their 30s and 40s and they think you're awesome, then you actually did something right. Right? So if you don't discipline your children, who's going to do it? Right? <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Who's going to do it? Right? If you don't discipline your children, who's going to do it? It's not no one. You know who's going to do it? The world will do it. And they are less loving than you. They care less for your children. And they are more cruel. So you have a choice. Will you discipline your children? Or are you going to transfer the role of discipline to a world that does not love your children as much as you do, right? So how do you discipline them? Parents, as we start 2023, you got to bring your kids to church. You got to bring your kids to church, right? Now, what kid wants to go to church? Nobody. No kid wants to go to church. You remember when you were a kid? Did you want to go to church? But guess what? Holy Spirit touched you. Now you love church. Right? But what are you doing? You are not placing them in a place where the Holy Spirit can touch them. Right? What kid wants to learn about God? But once again, if we don't set values for our children, who will? Someone more cruel, someone less loving, and someone who really don't love our children. You know, uh, I remember I was, I was walking in the education office, uh, in, in the education building. I was just, just kind of walking, and I saw a whole bunch of our treehouse kids, and they're just like, you know, walking past me. They're just walking past me. And, you know, I'm just like, oh, you know, treehouse kids, cool, right? And then uh, one kid stops, and he goes, Pastor Richard? And I was like, what? <laughs> and then he comes up to me. He goes, he goes Pastor Richard, I just want to say, my mom forces me to listen to your sermons. And I was like, huh? <laughs> and then he, he said, yeah, you know, and um, I just want to say, your sermons really helped me to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, thank you. <laughs> and I was like, what is your name? <laughs> I was like, what is your name? <laughs> You're amazing. <laughs> I was like, your parents are amazing, right? And I was so convicted. I went home that night. I said, girls, you guys are listening. You guys are going to listen to Pastor Keith. 
And then they listen to it and they're like, we have no idea what he's saying. <laughs> right? There you go. That, yeah, you bring your kids to church. You expose them to the things of God. Right? Let the word of God touch them. Let the Holy Spirit touch them. Why? Because they will love God, they will love the church, and the generational blessings will flow. Amen? Amen. You got to bring your kids to church. You think they're going to meet God on a baseball field? You think they're going to meet God on a basketball court? Right? You think they're going to meet God like in a bowling alley? I don't know. <laughs> this is serious. This is serious. You know why? I do college ministry. There's less collegians that are Christians now. There are less collegians that are Christians. All college ministries are shrinking. Why is that? Because they don't love Jesus. Why is that? Because when parents, when church and God becomes optional for parents, then it becomes non-existent for children. We overprotect them and do everything for them. You know, what's the problem of overprotection and doing everything? You know what's so funny? You know, for the longest time, I used to hear this thing called, uh, called helicopter parent, helicopter parent, right? You know, helicopter parent, you just like, you know, hover over your children. You know there's a new name now? There, I don't know if I just discovered this late. You guys heard of snowplow parent? Right? They're called snowplow parents. You know why? Because you just snowplow everything and you just create everything. Like, you just prepare the way. Just get rid of all obstacles. Right? Literally, just, just, just pave the way. Bulldozer parents. Right? Snowplow parents. Right? So, so you know, you, you, you help them with everything. So they always succeed. They always succeed. They never fail. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? They never grow. But here's the biggest problem. It creates an unrealistic vision for life. It creates an unrealistic vision for life, which will ultimately fail them when they're our age. When they're our age. They're going to fail at our age. And failing at our age is more horrific than failing when you're young. And we're doing that out of our love. We're messing up our kids. And as someone who does college ministry, there's more anxiety, more depression, more fear, more hopelessness. Why? Because they had parents who cleared everything for them, and now they're encountering resistance, and they don't know what to do with themselves. So now they're contemplating suicide. Right? What are we going to do about this? You know, we're the latchkey generation. You know, uh, if, you're, if you're Gen X, right, we're latchkey generation. You know what latchkey is, right? Parents never took care of us. <laughs> My mom left at 7 in the morning, didn't come home till like 10 p.m., I woke up, dressed myself to school, ate my own breakfast, walked to school, stopped by the market, bought dinner, cooked dinner, ate dinner, watched TV, like fed my dog. Like, you know, like, I took care of my own self. No protection whatsoever, man. Strangers knock on my door. I open it. No, my mom is not home. <laughs> right? You know, we got, we got messed up. But you know, you know one thing we all have? We got grit, man. Amen? Yeah. Hey, Gen X, rise up. Yeah. Right? You know, we got grit. Right? We got resilience. Right? I mean, we're messed up. We need more inner healing than anybody on planet. Right? I, you know, inner healing was created for us. But we got resilience, man. We got grit. We got toughness, right? You drop a nuke on us, we'll survive. <laughs> and because of that, because we don't want our kids to suffer the way we did, we do everything for them, and we're going to destroy them later on in life. <sighs> what you do now 
sets the stage for the future. Your present decisions affect your children's future. Let's follow the example of God our Father. God our Father gave up Jesus to suffer. He let Jesus go. He didn't hold on to his son, but he let his son go to unfold the great purpose he had for his son. And you know what the result of that was? Jesus became better. Jesus succeeded. He got the name above every name. So let me ask you, as we start 2023, what is, how is God testing you with your children? You know, um, I asked our education department to take some pictures. So this lighthouse, uh, one of my kids are in there. Here's greenhouse. Here's sprouts. Here's mini. Here's senior. Here's junior. Uh, second service junior. Second service mini. Sprouts. Senior. Aren't children a blessing? Amen? Yeah, children are a blessing. But guess what? But they're a test. Children are a test. Will we follow God's ways or will we follow our ways? Will we follow God's will for our children or will we follow our way for our children? And the blessings of God rests when we follow his ways. So as we start this year, I want you to give your children to the Lord. Give your children to the Lord. Now, I know we have some older children that are not walking with the Lord. I know we have older children that are lost, that are astray. I know we have older children that are struggling and suffering. I know. Uh, some of you guys have shared with me. And I just want to know, I, I'm, I'm praying for them. I'm praying for them. And, you know, one prayer night this week as I was praying for our wayward children, I had an image. And I saw this battlefield. And I saw Jesus. And he was dressed in like this warrior outfit. And I saw him holding these lambs. And they kind of looked bruised and battered and dirty, but they were in his arms. And I saw him carry them out of the battlefield. And I saw Jesus say to me, these are the children that I'm going to rescue through the faithful prayers of my people. So if you have children that are astray and lost, far away and in the darkness, through all of our prayers, Jesus will go and rescue them. Amen? Never leave that boundary of interpretation. God is good. 
He is all-knowing and he is all-powerful. And he listens to the prayers of the faithful. So we must trust in him. And God will deliver. And God will bring about a greater miracle. So, you know, as the praise team comes up, um, let's, let's pray for our children. Let's take some time and pray for our children. You know, let's dedicate, 2000, let's dedicate our children in 2023 to God. And pray for yourself, especially if you're a parent sitting here today. Is your parenting pleasing to the Lord? Is your parenting pleasing to the Lord? Is the way you parent your children pleasing to God? Right? What is God saying to you? How does God want you to love your children and to bless your children? God is faithful. God is good. God can be trusted. Give your children to the Lord. Give your children to the Lord. And after we pray for that, right? Yeah. So let's do that together. Let's pray.